I think it's on? Okay. I have some uh, handouts for you, and uh, I want to give the first one back here. And don't never let me hear you complain again. <laughs> here. Uh, well, he complained because I had a mis uh, The typewriter made a mis No, this is, this is, this is all new. Now there's. Which one's green? Right. Don't you have to get all the green? Hey, stay with us here. You can throw the old one away because it, it had uh, an error in it. An error. I don't mind if you don't. <laughs> you both have them open? first page of that is just a correction and then the second page is is uh, is the chart that uh, Jim had you write last week so I filled it in and it's all up to date except for what you will fill in today um, if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 12 Our lesson uh, today starts with uh, Abraham. Abraham was born in Hardin uh, County, Kentucky in 1809 and later moved to Illinois, uh, ran for uh, elective office there, eventually became the 16th. Oh, that's the wrong Abraham, isn't it? <laughs> I forget those notes. Our person of interest this week is Father Abraham, as the song says. Uh, Father Abraham, all the way through Isaac. Abraham is an interesting figure, but if you notice, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, uh, you won't find Abraham, rather you will find who? Abram. And I, I believe that that is, uh, that is very, very important. Uh, I've always uh, been careful in Scripture that when the Scripture changes a person's name, so do I. And I believe that the, the name is changed for a good reason whether it is Old Testament or New Testament. So let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll commence. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for the service that we have had, the message this morning, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we uh, gather now and as we look into the Scripture, that you will open it to us. Allow us to gain from it that which you would have for us this day. And we give you the praise in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think, um, I think most of us in this class, uh, at, uh, at our advanced age, uh, we have already... Uh, looked at the character of Abraham, Abram and Abraham. Uh, we have heard the stories. We know how he was called of God in, in chapter 12. Um, I had a man in my church uh, many years ago. Uh, he, he, he tried to point out that the first thing Abraham do, did was disobey God. And... Uh, he, uh, he said how God called Abram out of his land and told him to go to the land of Canaan, which he didn't, but 
to go there, which if you look at the map would have been like to go from Ur to, we'll just say to Jerusalem or Canaan, which would have been a straight path. And uh, instead, uh, Abram went up along the Euphrates River and up across the top and then down into the land of Canaan. And, and the fact that he did this rather than this was disobeying God. There's only one problem with that. It's not scriptural. Because if you look over at chapter 11 of Genesis, you find out that while, Cain, while Abram was of the land of Ur, which is at the base of the Euphrates and Tigris River, really down where many believe the Garden of Eden was, but while Abram was from that area, uh, in chapter uh, 12, or in chapter 11, verse 31, it says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his, son, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth from Ur of the Chaldees to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. You know where Haran is? It's up here. So when Abram was called and left, he didn't go from Ur. He is already in Haran, way up here. And, and so he went directly to Canaan, exactly as God had said. He said, uh, and the days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. And the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We all know that of Abraham or Abram, uh, especially those verses. You know, with what's going on right now in the Middle East, and, and uh, Jim alluded to it in his message, uh, I have, I have uh, uh, been looking on YouTube and listening to... Uh, uh, little sermons on YouTube, and there is so much uh, where the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church, where they are conflated together, and what's happening in Israel right now is, is a sign of the coming of Christ. And it's not. I, I thought what was interesting, though, was the other day I saw Benjamin Netanyahu. He, he held up a map of the Middle East, and in it was this little thing of Israel. And then he changed, he turned the map over, and he had this large green area. And it included Egypt and Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Iraq uh, and Lebanon and it, it, all that area. And, and this is this dynamic uh, economic zone that he dreams of, of, of building in the Middle East where these countries can come together in peace. And, and of course, he's working right now. They signed with Egypt years ago, but now they're working with Saudi Arabia to bring all these people together. And I thought to myself, his... His uh, picture there kind of looks like the promised land. There's a map in your handouts of the proposed, not today's, but ones you would have gotten a long time ago, but a proposal of the promised land uh, in the Middle East. But anyway, we have Abraham, Abram. And we know from Genesis chapter 12 that God has promised Abram a seed and he's promised to make him the father of many nations, and especially one. But what does Abram not have? He doesn't have any children. Not only does Abram not have any children, what condition is his wife in? 
She's what? She's barren. And not only the Bible says, not only is Sarah barren, but, uh, but the Bible describes Abraham later on as having a dead body. So here's this promise that God makes to Abram that you're going to have a seed and you're going to be the father of a great nation and yada, 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 and yet wait, he doesn't have any kids. Keep your fingers in Genesis chapter 12 and let's look at the New Testament. Romans chapter 4. I think as as you look at Romans chapter 4, I think you see an an aspect of the story of Abram that really speaks to the heart of what is happening in Genesis, what we can learn from Genesis, and how what we can learn from Abram and Abraham's life, what we can learn in our own. Abram's, or Genesis, Romans chapter 4, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4 starts off with, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now, essentially, when the Bible says, the King James says, Abraham, I assume the NIV does the same. In reality, though, in the, in the chronology of all of this, really it's Abram that he's speaking of right here. Uh, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, and not before God. For what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now when did Abraham believe God? Hmm? When God told him to go, right? God said, get yourself up, get away from your your family or whatever, and go to where I'll tell you. Now, was that Abraham or Abram? It was Abram, right? So we're talking at this specific here about Abram. And being Abram, he has no tie whatsoever, we'll say, to Israel, to, to Jews. Now, Abram is referred to as a Hebrew, but Hebrew really has nothing to do with Judaism, has nothing whatsoever to do with the Jewish religion. Hebrew speaks of Abram's ethnicity, not his religion, all right? And that's something, too, that you'll see as you, as you study the life of Abraham. We, we think of what's going on in the Middle East right now between the Jew and the Arab, uh, All of that goes back to Father who? Father Abraham. Because Father Abraham had two sons. One was who? Ishmael, and the other is Isaac. Ishmael is the father of a great nation, but it's the nation of what? Arabs. Ishmael is the father of, or uh, Isaac is the father of his, the Jews, the Israel. So you have this, this great divide between the two. It's interesting, though, that when Abraham died, out of all of Abraham, because Abraham will have more children after Isaac, after all his children, do you know who was there at his funeral? Isaac and Ishmael were there to bury the uh, Abraham. Right. But anyway, going back to Romans chapter 4. We'll skip on down uh, to verse, because uh, you'll, you'll have an account in there of David. Uh, go to verse uh, 9 or uh, 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessing, blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? 
For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And how is it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Which was it? It was in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet, being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. Now, Paul will later on in Galatians talk about the faith of Abraham and, and how we are the children of Abraham because of faith, all right? Anyway, you go on down here. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him who he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which he be not as though they were. Now, here we go. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, I, I, I said before, I had a couple in my church. Uh, he was in his 90s, and when he died, she lived to be 109 before she died. But I always use them as an example. I always ask uh, Nick and Ruth if they ever wanted to have more children. Yeah. This is, you know, this is, uh, Abraham was 100 years old. How old was Noah when he started the ark? Hmm? 600. Woohoo! Yeah. He, but it says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, God was able to do. My personal feeling is that throughout the whole story of Abraham, his encounter, you know, with Lot and all those things that, that happened in that whole passage, my personal feeling is that the entire story of Abraham can be summed up in verse 20 and 21. Because in essence, I believe that is why we even have the story of Abraham in our scriptures, is to show us what faith truly is. Now, you have the dispensational chart. You have that and now we come into the dispensation of promise, and the promise is made to Abraham of, of a great nation and of a land. All right, we have that. But if you study out the story of Abraham, his, 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 his children and even Isaac I don't believe that are at the real heart of the story of Abraham. And I don't believe the land is either. Now, the land will be described for you in, in uh, a later chapter. Yeah, in a later chapter, and it'll give you the boundaries of the land. But I think the way the Apostle Paul uses Abraham has nothing really whatsoever to do with Isaac, has nothing whatsoever to do with the land. What it deals with is the faith of Abraham the strength of Abraham in his faith. 
And when we look at these, these accounts, every chapter we find the faith of Abraham, the faith of Abraham. We find that even in the book of Hebrews, the faith of Abraham. And when you look at Romans, it says being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to do, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. We talk about our own salvation. I heard a woman one time ask a question in Sunday school, and the question was, when we get to heaven, will we not sin because we don't want to? Or because, uh, because we don't want to? Or because we, we, we just won't have, we just, you know, and I, I just wanted to jump out of my seat and say, lady, do you know what salvation is about? When we get to heaven, will we not sin because we don't want to? If that is truly at the heart of what this woman is thinking, then what does that say about the old sin nature? What does that say about Im the imputed righteousness of God? What does that say about justification? What does that say about the faith of Abraham demonstrated and acted out in our own lives? Because look what he says. My glasses. Verse 23, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him a righteousness, but for us also. Romans chapter 15, Paul says, Paul will say, these things were written for our learning. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And the word if there really should be translated since. Since we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our what? our justification. Jesus Christ died for what? My, your sin. Now, as Jim pointed out, I think last week, we don't sin because we are, you know, or what we, well, how was that, Jim? We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. All right? So Jesus Christ was crucified for our, the fact that we are sinners, our offenses. The very fact that, that we are born dead in our sin, the very fact that we are the, by wrath, the, the children of wrath, the children of disobedience, we are evil, wicked people. But Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses. He died for our sins. But he was raised for our what? Our justification. Now, when I was a kid growing up, just, the word justified meant just as if I'd never sinned. But as I've gotten older, I've, I've had a problem with that. Just as if I'd never sinned implies that I could have but just didn't. But what if justification means I am moved into a position whereby I no longer can sin because the righteousness of God has been imputed unto me? Now, I'm not talking about me as you see me. Ask my wife. We are all still capable and vulnerable to sin. But in Christ, I have been justified. I have been moved into a position of sinless perfection in Christ. That's why Paul says in Colossians, when God sees me, he does not see me. He sees his son in me. 
and verse five or chapter five verse one says, therefore being justified by faith, we are now at peace with God. And I believe that is the lesson that we need to learn from Abraham and from faith. This is what faith truly means. Now go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is, or Abram is 75 years old. God promises him a seed. If you come over to chapter 15 of Genesis, God will reiterate the promise that he makes to uh, Abraham. Verse 18 of chapter 15, he says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Don't tell the Egyptians, the Iraqis, and the Saudi Arabians that. Yeah. But he reiterates this covenant that he has made with Abram, and yet he still has what? No seed. Chapter 16 is, is going to give us a little bit of problem. Because in chapter 16, Sarah comes to Abraham and says, You know, I really, I, 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 I've never, I don't have any children. God made you this promise. Why don't you take my handmaiden over there, Hagar, and why don't you create the seed with her. A Abraham is 85 years, or Abram is 85 years old. He takes Hagar, and at the end of the chapter, it says that Abram was four score and six years when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So he's 86 years old. But God tells Abram that's not the seed. 86 years old. Already he's waited 11 years. Chapter 17. Now chapter 17 is going to be important because in chapter 17, God makes a new covenant with him. Look at verse 1. And when Abraham, Abram was 90 years old, 90 and 9, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and thou and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will uh, multiply thee exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, um, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations, of the uh, a father of many nations, I have made thee. God enters with Abraham now. He enters into a new covenant, and the covenant is sealed by circumcision. And in verse 24, it says, Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Now, I don't know about you, I've always said for Abraham to be circumcised at 99, it should have accounted for more than just righteousness. But anyway, he's circumcised at age 99, still does not have a son in chapter 17. Skip on ahead to chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah, and, and he had said, the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Now it says at the set time that God had spoken to him, which means Isaac is going to be born exactly when what? exactly when God wanted him to be born. 
Verse 5, and Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So uh, Ishmael's already a teenager, and along comes uh, Isaac, uh, and now Isaac will be uh, the chosen seed. And through Isaac, uh, the seed will come, and the seed, as the Bible says, not of many, but as one. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Chapter 22 then brings us to really Isaac. Now other than the fact that Isaac is Abraham's son and he grows up and he's obedient, we we don't know a lot about him yet. Um, We know what his seed will become and we've already talked about the fact that uh, uh, but anyway, Uh, you have this conflict. But now Isaac comes along, and remember, uh, Abraham has waited 25 years for him to be born. 25 years. 25 years of trusting in God. 25 years of constantly, you know, his wife was saying, you know, come on, come on, come on. But Abraham staggered not at the promise. 25 years he waited, and Isaac is born. And Abraham and Isaac develop a a good father-son relationship, a trusting father-son relationship. And what does God tell Abraham to do? What? Yes. What does Abraham tell, tell, or what does God tell Abraham to do with Isaac? Sacrifice him. How many of you have sons? How many of you would sacrifice your son? Am I the only one with my hand up? Believe me, there are times. Believe me. Yeah. I always think there's part of the story I've always looked in. Let's go to chapter 22. God tells him that what to do. Verse 2, he says, take now, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, only son, not Ishmael, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the uh, burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie The Bible where uh, George C. Scott portrays Abraham, there's a whole section in that movie where Abraham goes off into the wilderness and just grieves and pleads with God to, that this shouldn't happen. You know, I love my son. Don't take my son away. Why are you doing this to me? This whole thing. My Bible says that God told him to do it, and Abraham rose up early the next morning and did it. Verse 5, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Isn't that interesting? Abraham was a man of faith, wasn't he? He waited 25 years for Isaac to be born. Isaac is born, they develop a relationship, and God says, now I want you to go kill him. Abraham takes Isaac to the mountain. He tells his servants, you wait here, and what? We will come back. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and took the fire in his hand. Now, that's part of, I always found was kind of humorous. 
Abraham made Isaac carry the wood. Took the fire in his hand and, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here, here am I, son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. They came to the place where, Isaac, where God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar and laid the wood in, or, in order and bound his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. What does that tell us about Isaac? Obedience? Oh, he has to have faith. He has to trust his dad, doesn't he? You know, I, I said about my son, if, if you were to take your, you know, this is all burnt offering here, and you were to take your son, and as soon as you get there, instead of the lamp, you start to tie up your son. What do you think your son's going to do? I know what mine would do. Mine would just lay there and just say, okay. I wouldn't be able to catch him. Right? No, it wouldn't matter. Even at my age, I couldn't catch him. And I'm a lot younger than 100. Unless you ask my kids. He bound him and he laid him on the altar. And even Abraham, still believing and trusting God, took the knife, and he's ready to kill his son. And God says what? Stop. Stop. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, behind him, a ram in a thicket of the of his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Where do you think Isaac got that kind of trust and faith? From his father. From his father. Isaac will will grow now and become a real a real man of God. And Isaac will have two sons. Remember who they are? Jacob and Esau. But that's for another week. Yes, ma'am. No. Abramites. <laughs> Hebrews. Okay. The the term Jew comes from the the son of Isaac, Judah. Uh, and and you and really you don't have you don't have Judaism until after the law because the 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 whole Jewish religion is all tied up in the law. Um, Jim and I were talking uh, before, and, and no, we won't say anything this week, but there's an issue that I had with this lesson, um, and the dispensation of law and the dispensation of promise, it's very difficult to 
to arrive at a failure in your, in your chart, you know, the, the line failure. It's difficult to arrive at that uh, because what I would call a failure happens perhaps after the law. Um, and yet the failure has to occur before the law. Um, but yes, there's no, there's no Jewish religion really until after the law is given. And when the law is given, God gives Moses the, the Ten Commandments and the, and the law, but he also gives him what? You know, this is how a lot of people leave out. The law was given to show them how sinful they were, right? The schoolmaster showed them how sinful they were. Okay. But a lot of people forget about the fact that when God gave them the law, he did not leave them in that condition. What else did he give them? He gave them the tabernacle. So even though he gave them the law and he showed them their sinfulness, he gave them the tabernacle. That was all at the same time. Um, but yeah, there's no, there are no Jews per se, but I guess they would call Hebrews. But, you know, like I said, in Genesis chapter 13, Abram is referred to as a Hebrew. Uh, and, and that has to do with Eber and, and where he came from. You know, names, and they all meant something, had significance. And Hebrew comes from that, really comes from his great-grandfather, you know, whatever that lineage, you know. But, yeah. But they would have been called, I would guess they were called Hebrews. They were called Hebrews when they were in Egypt. So... Uh, yeah, I saw that in the Disney movie. Uh, Disney's my source for a lot of, uh, uh, but that theology, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always love to have, uh, uh, we, uh, oh, we're out of time. In that, in the Disney movie with, uh, what was it called, uh, Egypt? In the Prince of Egypt, yeah. Um, when the Red Sea is parted and, 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 you know, for the sake of all the children, what happened to Pharaoh and his army? You remember? When the water came back in, they were all thrown on the beach. And the Bible says when the water came in, they were what? They were all drowned, but I guess for the sake of our children, you, you, know, you do that. But it, what? Well, we 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 don't have it. Um, the the what? Yeah, you only can fill in the the first two because, like I said, we don't have the failure, and we and we don't have the the other yet. Well, you got promise and. And, and and Abraham, but that's that's all you have. Yeah. Uh, the the rest will be filled in. I think next next yeah next week. So. You know we we look at this and and I'll close with this. We look at the the, the dispensations and we look at the the beginning and the end of them, and sometimes and this is one. Sometimes it's very hard to see where one ends and one begins. Um, we like it. We would like it to have a line in the Bible, literal, but it doesn't happen. Uh, it will happen here. It will happen with between a dispensation of law and grace. Uh, and and as Jim pointed out this morning, it'll happen between grace and what follows. You know. Um, Anyway, anyway, uh, Abraham and Isaac, real, I think, real, a real lesson of faith and a lesson of faith that we can uh, really grab a hold of, but also grab a hold of the fact that in Christ we have been justified. I think that's important. So, well, let's close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. We're all going to Jim's house for lunch. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, 
the lessons of Abram and the lessons of Abraham. They can be difficult, and yet they can be glorious. And we're thankful for the faith of Abraham, as Paul says, that it's because of that faith that we can be counted as one with Jesus Christ. And so we are thankful for what you have given to us, these lessons that we are able to learn, but not just learn them, apply them, and live them. Thank you for this time together. We pray as we are dismissed that you would go before us to our homes and throughout this week that our lives truly may be demonstrations of your grace. Dismiss us with your blessing, and we give you the praise in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.